of when you teach a passage. And so this is what the sermonic aspect of the teaching outline here of Judges 6. And this one just really kind of lays it out neatly, succinctly. So we're going to very quickly take a look at this. Judges 6, 1 through 6 is the fourth cycle. Again, included sin, slavery, crying out to the Lord, deliverance, and rest. And it deals with Gideon, uh, one of the judges that most everybody is familiar with. You have the oppression under the Midianites was worse than the former oppressions. They've gone from bad to worse. And in verse 6, Midianite oppression brought severe deprivation, bringing the sons of Israel very low, it says, that they cried out to the Lord because of Midian. So there's something more to it this time. And there's also kind of a break in the cycle. There's a break in the pattern in verses 7 through 10, as God sent Israel a prophet before He called a deliverer. And it came about, verse 7, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian, that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. That hadn't happened with Ophniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, and Barak, but it happens here with Gideon. So we're interested to see what this prophet says. So he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. He gives them a historical reminder of who they are and what God had done for them. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. So this prophet recalls them to mind who they are, who God is, and their failure. This was new. For the first time, God sent a prophet to Israel before calling someone to deliver the people from oppression. This was the first time we see this happen. The prophet gave the Israelites a historical reminder before giving them God's message. And he lets them know that Israel was oppressed because of their disobedience to God's Word. Then verses 11-16, through 16, God called... Gideon, it's an interesting way it happens. And the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Well, that seems a strange thing to say to a man who's down in a hole threshing wheat. The Lord sees him is what he will be when he depends upon the Lord. It's a very short period of time that he does it, but nonetheless, he will be a valiant warrior when he does it. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Alright, so now let's watch what happens here. Gideon's fear, when God called Gideon, Gideon's fear and discouragement mirrored that of most in Israel. This is the attitude and the actions of most in Israel, this fear and discouragement. Verse 12, the Lord viewed Gideon according to his character in the future when he finally chose to depend on him. Just like the Lord when he sees Peter, you are a rock. Well, he wasn't at the time. But he was going to be when Peter grew and Peter depended upon the Lord. So it's looking forward to this event when Gideon will lead the charge for victory. Now here's where it gets unpacked for us. Gideon expressed his fear in four statements. So we watch these four statements and it out, this outlines the sermon for us. If the Lord is with us. See, he's doubting the presence of God with them much like the Israelites had done before when they were challenged with the lack of water. And the Lord's not with us. So he doubted God's presence. Why then has all this happened to us? He did not understand God's purpose. He has a lack of understanding of God's purpose. Third, where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? He did not think God's power was relevant in his time. You know, he hasn't acted for us, so where are they? He's not doing anything today. Where is the Lord? Now the Lord has abandoned us. He doubted God's personal involvement with Israel. 
Now, when God answers him, he's going to answer him in accordance with these questions or with these statements of Gideon. So, verse 14, the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He's answering the question regarding the presence of the Lord. He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Sounds a lot like Moses when the Lord says, you're going to be the one. Uh, no, it's not going to be me. And he's not the least in Manasseh either. He's got ten servants to help him destroy the, the statue here in a little bit. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. That would be a miraculous event. The Lord says he will be with him. So let's talk about this just for a moment. So verse 14, God's answer encompassed his power or strength and personal involvement. Have I not sent you? So he is personally there. The strength of the Lord is still present. Judges 6, 15, Gideon offered excuses to justify not obeying God. And that's what the fleece is going to be all about too. We'll check that out in a minute. It's not that he doesn't know God's will. He doesn't want to do it. Judges 6.16, God answered with a promise of His continued presence. I will be with you. Remember, He had asked, where is the Lord's miracles that He had done? You know, He's not with us, but He says He is. And Gideon's future importance, you shall defeat Midian. Now, verses 17-24, through God confirmed His promise. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Always looking for this sign. And the Lord meets him where he is. And all these times he asks for a sign. I mean, spiritually weak guy, this Gideon. Yet, he's in the hall of faith. Please do not depart from me or from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And the Lord said, I will remain until you return. Then Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour, put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. Now, this is a large offering in the midst of the economic problem they're facing. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth, and he did so. Now this is an act of faith of Gideon in doing exactly what the angel of God says. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. There's this fear of dying when they recognize they've seen the Lord, especially in the book of Judges. We see this several times. With, we'll see it later with Manoah. And as Manoah's wife says, you know, if the Lord really wanted to kill us, He'd have already done it. You know, and she's the one that brings any sort of spiritual reasoning to the table, uh, Samson's mom. The Lord said to him, Peace to you, do not fear. You shall not die. And Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it the Lord is Peace. To this day, it's still in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. So 17 to 18a, Gideon asked for a sign to verify that the person speaking to him was God. And the Lord meets him where he is. He promised to remain until Gideon returns. Gideon returns with this offering. Judges 6, 19, in a time of food deprivation, Gideon prepared abundant food to offer as a sacrifice to God. It's a sacrifice to the Lord. In verse 20, God instructed Gideon His obedience was an act of worship. This was a faith obedient act. It was an act of worship. The Lord's miracle in verse 21 demonstrated his personal involvement in God's life. That would be a miracle, not a mark. That's right. So you know. Verse 22 through 23, Gideon was afraid, so the Lord calmed his fears with encouraging words. And then Gideon built an altar that still existed at the time of the writing of the book of Judges. 
making this a historically verifiable account. You could go and check it out where the altar was. That's the idea. Well then, just to paraphrase, what happens next is Gideon's got idolatry in his backyard, in his father's backyard. And so before he can go deliver Israel from idolatry, he's got to take care of his home first. And that's what the next section is about, 25 through 32. God commanded Gideon to deal with Israel's principal problem, idolatry. Verses 25 and 26, first God commanded Gideon to remove all signs of idolatry from his father's house. He should take a bull and another bull that's seven years old, which would be a bull that had been alive throughout this time of the Midianite Depression. And he's to sacrifice it after cutting down the Asherah. Verse 27, Gideon obeyed God, but waited until nighttime. Gideon takes ten men with him, but he waits until it's dark so no one sees him doing it. He doesn't want to broadcast what he's doing. And then the people of the city are going to get upset. And they're going to come to Gideon's dad and and they're going to want to take Gideon's life. So Gideon's destruction of the idols upset the men of the city. And so the men of the city said to Joash, Gideon's father, in verse 30, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. And now Joash shows some spiritual perspicacity for a moment. He says, But to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal? Or will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because someone has torn down his altar. In other words, if he's really God, and, and then he ought to be able to kill Gideon by himself. And of course, he's not God. So the men of the city demanded Gideon's death. But Joash, whether he says this in faith or just trying to protect his son, tells the truth. Joash had the correct perspective on the events. And while this is getting ready to happen, we've got the Midianites on the move. They are getting ready for another attack. Organized attack against Israel. In 33 through 35. And then we have the sign of the fleece. And let's read through this for a second. Now, God had told Gideon, go in this your strength and deliver Israel. That seemed pretty clear. Okay? And he told, he'd understood what God said about the, the, the idol to destroy the Asherah and offer the bulls. That was pretty clear. So it's not that God's not communicating. God is communicating clearly Gideon's understanding. But watch what happens with the fleece. Because a lot of times people use the fleece as a good thing. Let me put out the fleece and find out what God wants me to do. That's not what this is about. Then Gideon said to God, verse 36, If you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, he knows what God has said. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. Twice he says it, as you have spoken. He understood what God said. And then it's interesting thing is, verse 38, and it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. So just in case that was a chance happening, verse 39, Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me. Seems to imply he knows he's pushing the limits of God's patience here. Let me speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece. And let there be dew on all the ground. So this would be a a greater type of miracle to take place. God did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece, and dew was on all the ground. (laughs) It's not that he doesn't know, it's he doesn't want to. That's the problem. So putting out the fleece is not how to find out God's will. This was how to get out of doing God's will, but didn't work. Judges 6.33, the Midianites joined with the Amalekites to cross over and raid Israel. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, empowered Gideon, who sent messengers throughout the land to organize against the enemy with this attack that they were organizing. And then 
It's time to put out the fleece before he gets these men and goes to battle. But Gideon attempted to avoid his responsibility as a judge or a deliverer. Gideon knew God's will, but did not want to obey. He knew God's will, but did not want to obey. Because God's plan needed to go forward with Gideon, God dealt with Gideon on Gideon's level, agreeing to give him a sign. He does it two times. Because God's plan needed to go forward, Gideon is the one that's going to move it forward with God's help. So he gets the wet fleece on the dry ground, which might have been an accident. Maybe a servant walked by earlier and just spilled the water on it. So he's trying again. Verse 39, he changes the conditions of the sign. Gideon changed the conditions of the sign. In verse 40, God treated Gideon with grace by meeting him where he is. And then Judges 7 and 8 record Gideon defeating the Midianites with God's divine intervention. And we're going to skip through this, but just real quick when it gets down to 300. When Gideon shows up to fight, he's got quite a number of men. He got 100,000 Midianites against 32,000 of Israelites. Now, if Gideon goes to battle with 32,000 or 34, whichever it is, and they're successful, everybody would go, wow, Gideon, he's quite the general. So God says, you got too many. Tell any of them that want to go home, go home. And so, does. And you end up with a lot less. You end up with about 22,000 men. And then he says, you still got too many. And, or it ends up with 10,000. you still got too many. Now, if he takes in with 10,000, and you've got uh, 100,000, and you beat them, you're still like, wow, that Gideon's a pretty good general. You know, he did a good thing there. God says, you still got too many. So he says, right there, where they are, they can see the enemy right in their direction. They go to the water. And he says, those who take the water and keep their eye on the enemy... Keep those guys, but the rest of them that lap it up like a dog with their head down in the water, get rid of them. And he's left with 300 men. So now when Gideon defeats the Midianites, 300 men versus 100,000 men, people are going to go, God is good. There's no way you did this on your own. That's the point. That's the issue that takes place with getting it down to Gideon's 300 chosen men. Verse uh, chapter 9, Abimelech, who is Gideon's son, they wanted to make Gideon king uh, after he had won the battle. He said, no, I won't be your king. God is your king. But then he names one of his sons Abimelech. You know what Abimelech means? My father is king. Even though he didn't want to be king, he kind of wanted to be on the inside. He just didn't want anybody to know it. But Abimelech tried to become leader and was punished for his treachery. And it's an interesting event that takes place with all that goes into this. And this guy gets himself really serious killed by a millstone on the head. Judges 10 through 12 is Jephthah, one of the most puzzling judges of all, because he knows more about Yahweh, at least what's recorded, than any of the other judges. And he's also the one that offers his daughter, ends up having to offer his daughter as a sacrifice. So it's a Interesting one. But he defeated the Ammonites, but made a foolish vow to God that resulted in the sacrifice of his daughter. And then 13 through 16 is Samson. Delivered Israel through his vengeful actions. Every time it, Samson does something, it's in vengeance. Even at the end. Note in Judges 16, 28. When he's blinded, his hair's grown back, he gets the boy to put him by the pillars of the temple. Then Samson called the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O oh God. He knows where his strength comes from. And that's a good thing. And that's a faith thing. But he says that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars of which the house rested and braced himself against them, the one with his right hand, the other with his left he says, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might, and the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it, so that the dead whom he killed at his death were more than all those he killed his whole life. But Samson flaunted with God his whole life. 
He was a Nazarite before he was even born, which meant he was not supposed to have anything to do with wine or grapes, wasn't supposed to touch anything dead, and he wasn't supposed to have his hair cut. What do you find him doing? Going through a vineyard on purpose. Gets attacked by a lion. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He tears a lion like you would tear a young goat. I don't know how you tear a young goat, but he tears it. He just rips this lion in half. And then he comes back later, and he's going through the vineyard again, and the lion, and there's bees there that have made honey. And he eats the honey. The lion's dead. It's a carcass. And he eats the honey, and he gives it to his parents. He doesn't tell them where it comes from. He defiles them. And then later on, he whoops up on the Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. I remember dealing with this at, uh, uh, one morning with my, my kids, my oldest son, Andrew. I think he was probably about five at the time. We were using these cards that had pictures of it. And I kept reemphasizing to him that uh, Samson was not supposed to have anything to do with grapes or wine. He wasn't supposed to touch anything dead, and he wasn't supposed to cut his hair. And I had, it had never dawned on me that when he whooped up the Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, that a jawbone is a dead thing. My son had to point that out to me. That's a dead thing, Daddy. Like, Duh, I miss that all this time. But anyhow, he, he keeps flowing in God. He does the same thing with his hair when he gets caught up with Delilah. Delilah wants to know what his strength is so she can get paid off by the Philistines. And he says something to the effect, well, if you'll bind me with some new cords, which are like catgut cords, dead things, strings, I'll become as weak as any man. Goes to sleep, finds himself bound with these cords. He says, the Philistines are upon you. He pops them and he whoops up on them. They have to run. He comes back again. She says, you don't really love me. You don't really tell me what your strength is. He says, well, if you'll, if you'll put my hair into a weaving thing, then I will be as weak as any man. He goes to sleep and he wakes up with his hair in the weaver. Now, couple things. One, he must be a heavy sleeper. And, and number two, he, not the brightest light on the tree because if you woke up one time bound by cords when he told her and now you wake up with your head in the weave, weaving thing, then would you do it again? And she says, the Philistines are on you. And he breaks out and whoops up on him. And then she starts crying on him and that's his weakness, just crying on him. He says, you really don't love me. You won't tell me your strength. Well, if you cut my hair... See, he'd messed with all these things, and now God hadn't done anything. So he goes all the way. If you'll cut my hair, I'll be as weak as any man. He goes to sleep and gets a haircut, and boom, loses his eyes when the Philistines come upon him because he's as weak as any man. He just kept taunting with it and taunting with it, getting closer and closer and closer, and then there was nothing left. He lost it all. Fascinating, he's in the hall of faith. That means there's hope for all of us. If Samson got in there, see, I like that. Judges 17 through 21. Israel continually strayed from God and His commandments. And uh, this is a really interesting narrative through these chapters. We just don't have time to go through them. A conclusion to the book of Judges, as you see the map here. Mesopotamia, this is where Othniel would be, the deliverer, the first one. And then we have, with the Moabites down here, that's going to be the time of Ehud. Then the Philistines with Shamgar. And then we have Deborah, it's going to be up here in, a, in Manasseh area, and in, in more of the middle part. It's going to, the, fact, the battle is actually going to be up here. And so then Gideon, uh, I have back here with the Midianites, or with the, uh, the, uh, the, the Midianites and Jephthah, uh, and Gilead on the other side, and then finally Samson, going to be down here at this point, um, down here in the area of Judah. Here they are again, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon. And these are the guys we just have their names, Tolad, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzon, Elon, Abdon. Now watch this. Here's Samson. These are Samson's years right here. This is Samuel's years. This map shows the overlap of the time frame. Samson and Samuel did live at the same period of time. Samuel, however, is the last judge in the first prophet. Note even Eli lives a little bit. It's quite possible that when Samson destroys those Philistines in the temple, it's what weakens them so that Israelite does have, the Israelites have victory over them. Some, some will put that together. But it's hard. You've got a lot of details to work through 
this was one of the best charts I'd seen on that. All right, so by way of conclusions. Judges clearly contrasted Israel's idolatry and resultant immorality with Yahweh's covenant faithfulness and resultant grace deliverance of Israel. <clears throat> Judges ends with Israel under Philistine oppression. And this is going to be a problem until David's day. I mean, David's fighting a Philistine, and it will be David that will finally deal with that problem completely. In Judges 21-25, the concluding statement prepared the reader for the events in the early chapters of 1 Samuel. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It gets us ready for that time period of Samuel and everything going on there, everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. All right, now we move to the book of Ruth, the book of beauty. Judges was the book of failure, now the book of beauty. The events in Ruth probably occurred in a 30-year period during the time of the judges. We know it's in the time of the judges. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. Now exactly where to put the 30-year period, kind of hard. It's got to be close enough to the time of David because we got Obed, Jesse, and David, but it's, it's hard to know exactly where to put it as far as within the other judges. Who is the judge ruling during that time? The book divides itself according to the chapter divisions in modern Bibles. It's a rare thing to see it like this. And really, it's called the book of Ruth, but it focuses on Naomi. You'll see that in my outline here. Ruth 1, Naomi had a bitter life. There's a famine in the land, and her husband Elimelech takes her and her two sons, sickly and whiny, and they go to Moab. Elimelech dies. Sickly and whiny are married, but they die. She has two uh, daughters-in-laws. She hears that it has been, the Lord has visited, <laughs> the Lord has visited Israel, and as a result, she wants to go back to the land, and Naomi takes Ruth with her, even though she doesn't want to. Ruth is going to go with her. But Naomi comes back and they say, hey, it's Naomi, which means pleasant. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Because that's what my life has been. So that's where this comes from. Ruth 2, Naomi had a blessed daughter-in-law. A blessed daughter-in-law, and that is Ruth. Ruth is a hard worker. She gains the attention of Boaz. There's a lot of working behind the scenes of providence here in this book. In Ruth 3, the chapter here, Naomi had a kinsman redeemer. Boaz is a closer relative who can redeem the inheritance that belongs to Elimelech and produce an heir for Elimelech's line. And the tension in the narrative is rather interesting because there's another relative that's closer than Boaz. Will he do it? And there's this neat little episode that happens with the shoe and the spitting on the ground and all that. But eventually, Ruth, Boaz, Mary, they have a son. So Naomi had a grandson who was the grandfather of King David. But there's several things of the importance of the book of Ruth. One, it shows the lineage of King David. But it also shows the lineage of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because we have the genealogy here of the Messiah going on. So the importance of the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is a refreshing account of the remnant that remained faithful to God and His law during the apostasy and anarchy of Judges. It's, it's like a bright spot during these dark times. It's a bright spot in the book of Judges. Or the time of Judges, I should say. It's almost like Judges, it's almost like chapter uh, the, the third section of the end of Judges. Judges 17 to 21 has two major sections, and Ruth could actually be kind of the third part of that. Ruth showed that Gentiles, that is non-Jews, have always been eligible for salvation. Ruth is not a, not a Jew, and yet she is saved. Your God will be my God. I'll go where you go. Which often is read at weddings, but it's a daughter-in-law saying it to a mother-in-law. The book introduced the kinsman redeemer or a type of Christ. The kinsman redeemer had to be related by blood to those he redeemed. 
Boaz had to be related to Naomi to be the kinsman redeemer. Christ is both true humanity and complete deity in one person forever. He is the mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 The kinsman redeemer had to be able to pay the price of redemption. Boaz had the resources. He could pay the price. The impeccable Christ was qualified to go to the cross as our substitute for our sins. He didn't commit sin, so he was able to pay the price for redemption. Even Herod announces his innocence at least three times, maybe four during those trials. But because he doesn't want any heat from the Jews, he has him crucified anyway. The kinsman redeemer had to be willing to redeem. And Boaz was. Boaz was willing to redeem by marrying Ruth and produce an heir in which he wouldn't have any inheritance with. It would be Elimelech that he's providing an inheritance for Naomi. Christ chose to pay the penalty of sin in his body on the cross. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, becoming the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but for the entire world. And fourth, the kinsman redeemer had to be free himself. Christ was free from sin because he was born with no sin nature and never committed one act of personal sin. In Hebrews we are told, he is tested in every way which we are, yet without sin. Alright, now we're ready to move to 1 Samuel. See, this time yesterday we'd been in one book all day. Now we're we're moving. So we have Genesis, the book of beginnings. Job, the book of undeserved suffering. We have Exodus, the book of redemption. At the end of that, we have Leviticus, the book of holiness. Then we have the book of numbers, the book of wandering. At the end of that, we have Deuteronomy, the book of review or repetition. Then we have Joshua, the book of conquest. Judges, the book of failure. And in connection with that, we'll have Ruth, the book of beauty. And now we move to 1 Samuel, the book of transition. The book of transition. 1 Samuel. Transitions us from the judges to the kings. First king we're going to meet is going to be Saul. But David will be anointed as king. As we get into 2 Samuel, then he will rule as king. So we're getting ready to look at 1 and 2 Samuel. And then Chronicles, we won't really overview Chronicles much, but 1 Chronicles is the parallel book to 1 and 2 Samuel. Alright, so 1 Samuel, the book of transition. Wonderful narratives that go on here in 1 Samuel. The book of Samuel transitioned from the time of the judges to the time of the monarchy or the time of the king. So we're looking at a rough period of about 100 years, from 1100 B.C. to 1011 B.C. The four key people in 1 Samuel are Samuel, Eli, Saul, and David. Samuel, Eli, Saul, and David. Mostly Saul and David. Samuel was the last judge and the first prophet. Samuel was the last judge and the first prophet. Writing prophets wrote the Old Testament books. And Samuel may have been the one that wrote Judges, possibly even Ruth. It's hard to say he wrote all of 1 Samuel because he's dead in part of it. Uh, but he may have wrote some of it. May have written some of it. Oral prophets did not write Old Testament books like Nathan, Ahijah, Elijah, and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha didn't write, but there's a lot written about them. So you keep the difference between writing prophets and oral prophets. Some were both in one sense, like Jonah, for example. He was both an oral and a writing prophet, but we usually keep the distinction. Eli was the last Levite priest through whom God provided direct special revelation. Samuel served as priest but was from the tribe of Ephraim and by serving as priest he kind of served in the role of it for a little while offering sacrifices until things got reestablished or balanced out. 
God is going to shift from working through the priesthood to working through the prophets. And that's going to be the way it will take place throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Saul was Israel's first king, but lost the kingdom through disobedience. That's just an overview of these, these men. David, the second king of Israel, was declared a man after God's own heart. The first king of Israel is a man after the people's own heart. But David is a man after God's own heart. So 1 Samuel, we have recorded four key events. 1 Samuel 4, the Philistines defeated Saul in the battle of Aphek and took the, car, the Ark of the Covenant. Defeated Saul in the battle of Aphek. 1 Samuel 8, Israel requested a king like the pagan nations. They wanted to be like the pagan nations. 1 Samuel 15, because Saul failed to completely obey him, God tore the kingdom from him. And in 1 Samuel 17, David's defeat of Goliath verified that he was God's anointed king. These are some four major events. The defeat at Aphek is like the big event until the destruction of the temple as far as the national level is concerned. So the first three chapters, the birth and early life of Samuel, in 1, 1 through 3, although Elkanah faithfully worshipped at Shiloh, his polygamy, his two wives, set a rebellious tone indicative of the time of the judges. Verse 2 says, He had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah, who I just like to call Penny. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, which is where the tabernacle is. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, not the same guy with the zeal back in Numbers, were priests to the Lord there. Verses 4 through 8, God emphasized the problems of polygamy to reinforce the wisdom of his plan for one man and one woman in marriage. You have this rival going on between Hannah and Penny. Her rival, however, verse 6, would provoke her bitterly. And this drives Hannah to the Lord. And Hannah prayed for a son and promised him for service to God. And Eli, the high priest, misunderstood Hannah's actions but blessed her after her explanation. He thought she was drunk, which probably been the case for most, I guess, in this time, and he just assumes the worst, but she was not, and as a result, he does bless her. 19 through 28, Hannah kept her vow to the Lord by giving Samuel to service in the tabernacle. When, she, when he's born, she weans him and then dedicates him to service in the tabernacle. She keeps her vow. Verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2, we have Hannah's song. It was a prayer of praise based on her knowledge of God's character. And it's absolutely fascinating how much she understands. And the only thing that rivals it from a woman will be Mary's song in Luke, the Magnificat. And both of them is interesting to study them together, and what both of these women understood of God and his plan. 12 through 26, Samuel's faithful service differed from that of Eli's. Wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Samuel's faithful service is contrasted with these two guys. They are rotten. Of course, Samuel's boys are going to be rotten as well. Verse 27 through 36, because Eli was unfaithful, God declared judgment on him. What happens is the sons of Eli are keeping people from worshiping God correctly. They despise the offering of the Lord. And Eli doesn't do anything except say, boys, y'all ought not do that. These things ought not be. And because he doesn't reprimand them, take care of them, then the Lord is going to take the priesthood away from him. And what's interesting is the Lord tells Eli this, and then he's going to tell Samuel the same thing. But Samuel's afraid to tell Eli, but eventually he tells him, and the two messages match independently of each other. The Lord gave them both the same message. 1 Samuel 3, 1-10, Samuel received an unexpected message from God and responded with humility. He gets called several times. He thinks it's Eli. And then finally, he, Eli understands who it is and tells Samuel to say, Speak, for your servant is listening. And he hears the word of the Lord of what's going to happen to Eli. 
11 through 14, God announced the impending destruction of Eli's family because of Eli's iniquity. And in 15 through 21, Samuel sadly told Eli God's message of judgment. Eli says, May he do to you what he said he's going to do to me if you don't tell me everything. So he tells him. But Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail as long as he was prophet. In Israel. First Samuel four through seven, the battle of Aphek and the loss and return of the ark. The Philistines are back. The dominant power at that time battled Israel, killing four thousand Israelite men in the early parts of chapter four. And they asked the question, and it's a legitimate question they ask in verse three. Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Good question. Wrong answer that they get. Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. They treat the Ark like a lucky charm. They're disrespecting the character of God. They don't understand their purpose anymore. So the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who sits above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So they were instrumental with this. So the people asked the correct question, but did not answer it correctly. They treated the ark of God as a good luck charm, just as the pagans in the land treated their idols. We need our, we need our God with us. And they're thinking the ark is their God. And so they're treating the ark as an idol, which shows us that you can take of things that God legitimately gives and pervert it, just like the Pharisees did with the law. 1 Samuel 4, 6-9, The Philistines remembered God's past displays of power better than did Israel. Therefore the Philistines were fearful. Watch what they say. When the Philistines heard, verse 6, the noise of the shout, they said, What does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. I mean, they recall better than Israel does of their history. And then someone says, Take courage and be men, O Philistines, or you will become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been slaves to you. Therefore, be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. The battle of Aphek was a huge defeat. One guy gets away from the battle. Eli's sitting there. Text tells us he was old, couldn't see very well, and he was fat. And one guy comes along and he says, How does it go, son? My son, how's the battle go? Well, Israel's been routed. Your sons have been killed. And the ark has been taken. And Eli falls over backwards, breaks his neck, for he was heavy, it says, depending on the. Uh, text you read. So Eli received the message of judgment in three parts. The Philistines had utterly defeated, defeated Israel. His sons were dead, putting the succession of the priesthood in jeopardy. But there's going to be a son born by the name of Ichabod, which means no glory. The glory had departed from, the, from Israel with the ark being taken. Philistines had the ark. But they're about to find out they don't want it. Let's check it out. What happens in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. This is their god that they worship. Might have been in the shape of a fish. Uh, hard to say. When the Ashdodites rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. See, it's a bad thing when your idol is bowing before another god. Falls over. Isaiah and Jeremiah deal with this. You know, they gotta, Isaiah says they, they build their idols with silver chains. The chains are to anchor the idol so it doesn't teeter-totter. What kind of god you got that can teeter-totter? And so here you got Dagon lying in a basin before the ark. This kind of throws him for a loop. Next day, verse 4, when they arose early in the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark to the Lord. 
And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Bad enough when your God falls down, worse when he breaks. Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. It's a Dagon shame. Now, the hand of the Lord was heavy on the Ashdodites. Watch this. I love this. And he ravaged them and smote them with tumors. But Ashdod... Uh, both Ashdod and its territories. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for His hand is severe on us, and on Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines to them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? I mean, they don't want it anymore. They said, Let the ark of God of Israel be brought around to Gath. And they brought the ark of God around, of Israel around. After they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city with very great confusion. And he smote the men of the city, both young and old, so that the tumors broke out on them. Everywhere they take the ark, they get these, the tumors are hemorrhoids. They get these really bad cases of hemorrhoids. They don't want it anymore. They don't know what to do. So in chapter 6, they tell them what to do. The priest do said, get you an ark, or a, a cart, put the ark on it, and get two milk cows that have just given birth. Hitch them up together. And most of the times, what would happen, they're going to fight each other to get back to their calves. But what they say is if the ark really belongs with Israel, then they'll go lickety split back there. And also put some golden tumors. Which I don't know how you make golden hemorrhoids. But they were to put golden tumors with there. It might be they made, uh, they made like golden rats, which they might have associated with the, with the plague that they got. But they put all that on there, and sure enough, the cows go right back to Israel. And when they get back there, the Israelites are excited. They tear down the cart, kill the animals, build an altar, sacrifice with the wood, and burn the animals there in praise of God for bringing the ark back to Israel. And then they look in. <laughs> and they get, some of them get very seriously killed as a result. But the, God does get the ark back into the land of Israel. It's a real comical event that takes place as we see God meeting the Philistines where they are with all this Dagon stuff. So with the birth of Ichabod brought hope to the nation because the priesthood was preserved. He was born right as his father had died. But the ark of God was now with the Philistines. So in verse 1, after their victory over Israel, the Philistines took the ark of God, which represented his presence to Ashdod. And it's not that God's no longer in Israel, but that was the kind of the picture is the idea. That's the way Israel was kind of wanting it in one way. 1 Samuel 5.2 To symbolize their conquest of Israel, the Philistines placed the ark in the temple of their false god, Dagon. 1 Samuel 5.3 In a display of his infinite humor during the night, God placed the false god, Dagon, face down, bowing to the ark. One wonders if an angel got to do that. And then the next, next night, they're kind of lobbying for the job. Let me go. Let me go do it. You know, you can imagine the angels getting a kick out of that kind of thing. 1 Samuel 5, 4, The presence of Creator God shattered the false god. In the sense of... And he's, again, he's meeting the Philistines where they thought that was Israel's God. The presence of Israel's God. So they're, he's teaching them something. The event devastated the Philistines. Verse 5. Verses 6 and 7, God used the physical ailment to convince the Philistines that their victory over Israel did not come from their false god. The victory over Israel came because God was teaching Israel something. The Philistines passed the ark from one city to the next with the same ailment ravaging each city. Everywhere it went, they kept getting these tumors. And then verses 1-9, through nine, the Philistines sought the advice of their priests who instructed them to send the ark back to Israel. Get it out of there. Alright, here's, here's Ashdod, Gath, Ekron, Ashkelon. These are the cities of the Philistines where the ark went around. The Philistines sent the ark back into Israel 
And the people who received it worshipped the Lord. Fifteen through twenty, the Lord disciplined those Israelites who irreverently gazed into the ark. Over fifty thousand men died, or people down of all the people, fifty thousand fifty thousand men. The ark remained in Kiroth Jarim for twenty years. That's important because when we get to Saul, Saul doesn't seem to be too concerned about where the ark is, but one of David's first concerns once Jerusalem is captured is what to do with the ark. 7, 3-4, Samuel gave a sermon and Israel responded. Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, If you would return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and Asherah from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve Him alone, He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel did that. They removed the Baals, the Asherah, and served the Lord alone. Samuel used four key terms to present the solution to Israel's problems. Return, remove, direct, and serve. The sons of Israel removed their idols and sought to serve God alone. And then they, he leads Israel in a sort of a revival. In verse 6, they gathered a mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. So they're recognizing that they've been wrong. Samuel led Israel in revival as they gathered at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard the sons of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. See, in the Philistine mindset, the only reason you gather together is to get ready for battle. So they assumed that's what was happening. So God gave Israel victory over the Philistines. Because verse 8, And the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord our God for us, that He may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them, so that they were routed before Israel. God just coughs and boom, they're routed. The Philistines misinterpreted the reason for Israel's gathering at Mitzpah. They misinterpreted the reason. The sons of Israel recognized that victory came from the Lord. It says, do not seek to cry to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Verses 9 through 10, Samuel followed the correct procedure of offering a sacrifice to God before Israel went into battle. First Samuel 7, 10b through 11, God confused the Philistines with thunder, resulting in Israel's routing the enemy. And then what's going to happen in chapter 8? We want to have a king like all the other nations. What other nation has had God thundered and then you whoop up on the enemy? They were supposed to be different from all the other nations, but yet they wanted to be like the others. In 1 Samuel 7, 12-17, while Samuel judged Israel, the land was at peace. So 1 Samuel 8, through 10, God gave Israel a king after their own heart. Samuel's sons did not follow their father's faithfulness to God, and they pretty much tell him so. The text says, His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain, and took bribes and perverted justice. And the people know it. In verse 5, the people say to Samuel, You've grown old. Thanks. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. He takes it to the Lord. So the sons of Israel asked for a king in order to be like other nations. And the Lord is going to tell Samuel, Listen to them. But tell them what a king is going to do. <laughs> 
So 4, 5a, the Israelites used the problem of Samuel's sons to request a king. 5b, no other nation had God thunder to give them victory, but they wanted to be like other nations. Verse 20, that we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us, and this is important, go out before us and fight our battles. They want a king to go out and fight their battles. That will be important when we get to 1 Samuel 17. So we want to tuck that back into our mind for a little while. 1 Samuel 8, 6. Samuel was upset because their request for a king demonstrated their rejection of God as their ruler. Again, there was no king in Israel. They rejected the theocracy. Now they want a physical king. And God's going to give them one. 1 Samuel 8, 7 through 9. God told Samuel to listen to the Israelites. You listen to their voice, verse 9. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. God had always planned to give Israel a king. We saw this yesterday with the prophecy with Judah, the scepter, and the line of Judah, and then what was said in Deuteronomy 17. We saw that God always had this in mind. But for it to be right, it needs to be on His timing. And they're wanting to jump the gun. 1 Samuel 8, 8 and 9, God instructed Samuel to warn Israel of the evil a king would do, or maybe we just should say could do, Though it is spoken of as He will. In 1 Samuel 8, 10-18, Samuel instructed the people on the problems they would have with a king. He says, verse 11, He's going to take your sons and place them for Himself in His chariots. He's going to have a military draft. Verse 13, He's going to have four servants. He's going to take your daughters. Verse uh, 14, he will take the best of your fields. He's going to have land confiscation. Verse 15, he will take a tenth of your seed. This will be taxes. Verse 16, he will also take your male and servants and your female servants. He's going to have a loss of personal liberty. He will take a tenth of your flocks and your, you yourselves will become his servants. Still want a king? Verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. We don't care what he's going to do. We've got to have one. Very well. God planned to grant their request for a king even though they asked with wrong motives. First Samuel 9, 1 through 10, 10, Samuel introduced Saul as the king of Israel. And it's an interesting thing that happens. Saul becomes gets anointed king because he can't find his donkeys. Or can't find his father's donkeys. One, two, Saul, a tall and probably good looking man, was from the tribe of Benjamin. Not from the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of Benjamin. Later on, there'll be another Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, later known as the Apostle Paul. Three through twenty, Samuel first found Saul performing the ordinary act of looking for his father's property. He's lost his father's donkeys. Verse three. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to his son, "Take now with you one of the servants and arise, go search for the donkeys. Go get them back." And they can't find them. They end up wanting a man of God or a prophet, and they they're near a town where Samuel is, and they you try to go to Samuel to find the donkeys. Verse 20, as for your donkeys which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's household? And then, in verses 21 through 27, Saul displayed humility by noting he was from the smallest of the tribes. Saul replied to Samuel, when Samuel's telling him he's going to be king, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all families? Why then do you speak to me in this way? So there's a sense of humility that's not going to last very long. Actually, we're going to see him be very arrogant later. 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 10, Samuel anointed Saul king and explained the events that would verify God's choice of him.
In 17 through 27, Samuel introduced Saul as the king of Israel. And in chapters 11 and 12, God gave Saul military victory. Often this is what God will do. He's chosen a man. He's going to verify it by giving him the victory. And Samuel reminded the people of the importance of serving God alone. It says in verse 6, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily when he heard these words, and he became very angry. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out as one man. He does this to gather up. They get 300,000 and 30,000 of the men of Judah, and they're going to have military victory. You will have deliverance, he is told. So 1 through 11, Saul stood firm against the Ammonites and defeated them with the Spirit of the Lord God upon him. First Samuel eleven twelve through thirteen, Saul dealt wisely with those who did not support him. Verse twelve. Then the people said to Samuel after the victory, "Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death." But Saul said, "Not a man should be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel." This was a wise decision. Those that had sided with Saul wanted to put to death those who had not. Saul says, "No, we're not going to do that." Now this is one of few of Saul's wise decisions. 14 and 15, at Gilgal, Saul was installed as king of Israel. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they also offered sacrifices of peace, offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. 1 Samuel 12, 1 through 25, Samuel addressed Israel, admonishing them to obey and serve the Lord only. Verse 14 is a key verse. He says, If you will fear the Lord and serve Him and listen to His voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. In verse 22, For the Lord will not abandon His people on account of His great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for Himself. That's a reference Abrahamic covenant, the positional aspect for Israel. All right, let's take a break right there.